Hello, everyone. Welcome to this analytics workshop. My name is Christopher Sharkey. I'm a solutions architect, a specialist in analytics with Amazon Web Services. I'll speak to you today about how to set up and use Apache Iceberg tables on your data lake. The agenda for the session is as follows. I want to begin with a discussion of what is Iceberg or Apache Iceberg. I then want to talk about how does Iceberg work. This will be a technical deep dive into the backend architecture of Iceberg. I'd like to discuss AWS services that are commonly used with Iceberg. And after we finish covering these three points via PowerPoint presentation, I'd then like to actually pull up the AWS console and give you a demonstration of Iceberg working with our common AWS services. Given this agenda, let's begin by discussing what is Apache Iceberg? If you search on the internet, what is Apache Iceberg? You'll probably find a definition that looks something like this. It's a pretty standard definition, and there's a couple variations of it, but you'll generally see this. I want to call out a couple key pieces in this definition that I think are most important. If we begin with the first sentence, Iceberg is an open table format for huge analytical tables. A critical piece in the definition of Iceberg is open table format. Iceberg is an open table format. An open table format is a way to organize data files and bring database-like features to a data lake. We'll cover what database-like features means in subsequent slides. But the first thing to understand about Iceberg is if you have a data lake and you want to have a framework for organizing the data files and working with it more in a database-like way, then Iceberg can be a really good use and uh, be very beneficial. The next part of the definition is huge analytical tables. So Iceberg is designed to work with large data sets that can have thousands of partitions, which can each in turn have thousands of underlying files. It really is designed to scale for larger data volumes and those types of scenarios. Getting into the second sentence of the definition, the next key part that is really important is Iceberg brings the reliability and simplicity of SQL tables. Iceberg's interface is primarily SQL driven. If you're already comfortable with working with SQL expressions, perhaps in uh, databases, then you'll probably find it's a little bit easier to get started with Iceberg. And that is a benefit of Iceberg as well, is that it primarily works through simple SQL expressions. And the last part of the definition that I really want to call out is the types of engines that support Iceberg. Iceberg in and of itself is, is a framework for doing things which um, that are covered in this definition but it's usually paired with an actual compute engine to implement it. Some common engines include Spark, Trino, Flink, Presto, Hive, and Impala, but this is by no means exhaustive. There's definitely other engines out there, oftentimes open source, that support Iceberg. So again, if you're thinking about the definition, really key parts is that open table format piece, the fact that Iceberg can scale, you're primarily working with SQL, and you're generally pairing Iceberg with something like Spark, Trino, Flink, you know, Presto, Hive, or Impala to actually um, bring Iceberg to bear. So given this definition, what are the benefits of using Apache Iceberg? You can certainly have a data lake and have a really effective data lake without using a framework like Apache Iceberg. So what are the benefits of using it? Or another way to think about this is, why would you use Apache Iceberg? I'll go through the benefits or the, some of the reasons to use Apache Iceberg. And this can help you understand when and where Apache Iceberg might be a good fit for the types of workloads that you have. So the first piece is really asset compliance. Iceberg guarantees isolated reads and writes. Uh, and this means that readers, when they're querying Iceberg, will always see a consistent version of the data. It avoids a problem of what I like to call, um, you know, no dirty reads or avoiding dirty reads. If you have a traditional data lake and you're not using a framework like Iceberg, 
if you have a Spark job, as an example, that's writing data to your data lake, and say it's writing a large volume of data, so it's going to take several minutes, you could have a scenario where the Spark job is halfway through writing the data, and someone comes to read it, and they read that partial data or that dirty data, so to speak. Iceberg, again, it isolates the readers and writers so that your readers, if you're using Iceberg, wouldn't see that data that's being written until the write is completely finished. So this is one benefit of Iceberg, and it's one of the reasons that it brings database-like features to a data lake, because the asset compliance is usually something that we think about in the context of a relational database. The other piece to think about that Iceberg gives you as a benefit is rollbacks and time travel. Iceberg captures changes in, to a data lake in the forms of transactions, and those are captured in the forms of snapshots. So when you write a bunch of data to Iceberg, that's captured as a single transaction or a single snapshot. You know, you then subsequently later on write more data or update data. That's a, a separate transaction or a separate snapshot. Um, and a, these snapshots are a representation of a state of a table at some time. Because Iceberg gives you this ability to have these transactions and, and manage these snapshots, it's possible to query its previous states of an Iceberg data set and to either roll those changes back or to look at the table at different points in time, i.e. what we call time travel, of course, assuming that we're retaining an appropriate snapshot history. The next benefit is flexible SQL, which we talked about in the definition of Iceberg. Iceberg supports SQL commands and expressions that there's a good chance you're already familiar with if you have a background in SQL. And it also gives you additional capabilities that you don't have in just the standard Spark SQL not using Iceberg. Some of these additional capabilities include operations such as merging or updating data um, or deleting data as well. Hidden partitioning is also a benefit of Iceberg. It goes to that um, scalability part of Iceberg. Um, under the hood, um, Iceberg tables, when you create them, you can just specify a column in your Iceberg table to partition on. And then Iceberg does the process of actually partitioning the data behind the scenes for you. So we call it hidden partitioning because you can just specify the column to partition on, and Iceberg can manage those partitions in terms of size and actual implementation of them. And the last benefit that I'll cover is schema evolution. So Iceberg supports what we call in-place table evolution. Generally, if you're not using a framework like Iceberg and you make a change to a schema, you might need to rewrite an entire data set to have that change take effect. Whereas Iceberg, you can do that in place without the need to rewrite the entire data set. These are some of the benefits of Iceberg. Um, there are other benefits, but these are the common ones that I commonly see uh, customers interested in or people implementing Iceberg interested in. So given that we've now covered the definition of what is Iceberg, we've talked some about the benefits of Iceberg. I do want to talk about how Iceberg actually works behind the scenes. Again, this will be a technical deep dive into how Iceberg does things like manage metadata. It's not critical that you understand everything about how Iceberg works behind the scenes to get started with it. However, once you start to productionalize Iceberg workloads, or in particular work with larger data sets in Iceberg, it is helpful to have a working knowledge of how Iceberg actually gives us those benefits that we talked about. And that's what we'll discuss in this next section. So the first piece to understand is Iceberg has two layers. It has a metadata layer and a data layer. Iceberg's metadata layer is subsequently composed of multiple layers, and we'll deep dive into each of these layers next. But at a high level, this metadata layer that Iceberg has is what gives Iceberg the ability to do those extra capabilities that we talked about, like capture snapshots, adapt the schema evolution, and, and other features. The data layer um, is where the actual data is stored. So as you might you know, imagine, this is where the physical parquet files, for example, are, are stored for the actual data. Iceberg's combination of this metadata layer, which has multiple sublayers, and this data layer is what gives it all of those benefits that we talked about earlier. If you take a look at the 
image that I have on the screen, you'll see that it's a screen capture of an S3 bucket. This is an example iceberg table that I created in this S3 bucket using one of the AWS tools, Athena. And what you'll see is that because it's an iceberg table based on S3, at the highest level, you have a data folder and you have a metadata folder, which speaks to what we're talking about here, the metadata layer and the data layer. The metadata layer is probably the more complicated part or the part that we need to talk more about. So I wanna next go into each of the sub layers in the metadata layer. There's the metadata file, manifest list and manifest file. We'll start with the metadata file. Before I talk too much about the metadata file, I do wanna call your attention to the image that I have on the screen here. This is a pretty common architectural representation of iceberg. If you look at the iceberg documentation or any blog posts there out there, you'll probably see something pretty similar to this. Notice that at the top of this diagram, we have um, our data catalog, our glue data catalog, or iceberg catalog. And in there, we have our table definition, this Amazon reviews iceberg table. And that immediately points to our metadata file. And that metadata file is really the first level of metadata that Iceberg keeps. The metadata file has table level information in it. Table level information, for example, includes table schema, partitioning configurations, any types of custom properties. And then you'll also notice in the diagram that in that metadata file, the green blocks, there are the blue circles, which are the snapshots. The metadata file doesn't contain all of the information about the snapshots, but it does know that in this example, there is a snapshot zero and a snapshot one, which were two different transactions that maybe happened against this particular iceberg table. So the last thing to understand about the metadata file before we move on to talking about the manifest list is that each metadata file can have one or more corresponding manifest lists. So we'll talk next about manifest lists, which are the next layer of metadata underneath the metadata file. But remember, metadata file is table level metadata. This captures information like schema, partition, configurations, and custom properties. So let's talk next about the manifest lists. Manifest lists are snapshot level metadata. The metadata file that we previously discussed, again, is table level metadata. And each snapshot in the metadata file um, needs to be defined. And each snapshot is encompassed in a manifest list. What this means is that every snapshot or every transaction that occurs on an iceberg table will have a corresponding manifest list. And if you're tracking this through the layers, if our metadata file has the table level metadata and the table is made of many snapshots, then each snapshot has a manifest list, which captures the first level of metadata as it pertains to a snapshot. Now the manifest list corresponds to a subsequent manifest file. And the manifest file, which if we now look at, contains actual data level metadata. So this could be a list of data files as an example. And oftentimes the type of information that the manifest file captures is information about the data files, such as column level statistics. So now if you're thinking about understanding the layers of metadata, at the top of the diagram, the metadata files are table level metadata. The manifest list is our snapshot level metadata. And then the manifest files is our metadata about the actual data. And when you put these three together, they can all relate to each other and tie back to each other, where snapshots that are part of the metadata file, if we need the information about the snapshot, we go to the manifest list, which subsequently points us to manifest files and subsequently point us to data files. The manifest files can be significant because the types of information that they have, such as column level statistics, can be used by Iceberg to help improve its performance. And the last thing to remember here as well is that each manifest file can have one or more corresponding data files. Now, finally, if we look at the data files, um, 
this layer is somewhat self-explanatory. It's again, the actual data itself. It's the parquet files. Um, you know, this is where the actual partitioning is applied as an example. And again, it's this combination of these three layers of metadata with the actual data files that make up the iceberg framework behind the scenes. Now, I know it can be kind of um, complicated if it's the first time you're taking a look at the different layers behind iceberg, and especially since there's multiple levels of metadata. So I put together this animation to try to help make clear how these different layers might work together. And I want to look at an example where the first thing that we're doing is we're writing to date, we're writing data to S3 via Iceberg. So we're using maybe an AWS service that supports Iceberg, and we're doing the initial write of data to it, to an S3 bucket. So of course, in writing data to an S3 bucket, we're ultimately going to have those data files, right? Um, you know, we need to at some point establish those Parquet files through Iceberg and actually have the data there. When Iceberg writes the data files, each of the data files have, or many of the data files have corresponding manifest files. These manifest files, again, are metadata about the data. It's going to have things like the column level statistics. And these manifest files are going to link back to a manifest list, which is going to represent snapshot, the first snapshot or the transaction that we did writing that initial data. So now we can think about the metadata file, which has the table level information and has that snapshot zero in it. And that links back to, in our catalog, a pointer from the actual table definition. So again, if you're thinking about this first example of um, writing data to an iceberg table, uh, perhaps for the first time, you know, you have your table, the Amazon reviews iceberg, the metadata file captures things like the schema of the table, Right now, we only have snapshot zero because we've only done one thing, which is write the initial data. Um, that snapshot zero is captured through the, ma the manifest list that corresponds to snapshot zero. The manifest list corresponds to manifest files, which correspond to data files. Now, let's look at an example where we're going to have another snapshot. We're going to update several records in the iceberg table, and maybe we're going to add several new records. So in adding several new records, we might establish some new data files. Iceberg might do that for us. And we might also update some existing data files. So for the new data files, we might have a new manifest list created as an example, which will capture the statistics for those files. And since this is the second transaction that we're doing, um, or in our case, it'll be snapshot one, then we're going to have a manifest list that represents this new snapshot or this new transaction that's happening. It'll correspond to the manifest files for the data files that we updated or created. And then now our metadata file will be updated to have both that snapshot zero and one, which point to the corresponding manifest lists. So this is a good example, again, trying to walk you through an animation of what this might look like um, if you're thinking through an example of like writing some initial data and then making some changes and adding some data. Again, it's not entirely necessary to understand um, all of the details about how Iceberg works behind the scenes to use it and get started, but it is really helpful for your understanding, especially if you're looking at using it for uh, more large scale workloads. So with that said, let's talk now about what type of AWS services are commonly used with Iceberg. So far, we've covered what Iceberg is, we've covered the benefits of Iceberg, we've covered how Iceberg works, those metadata layers and the data layer, but which AWS services might you commonly use with Apache Iceberg? I point us back to our definition of Iceberg, where we called out that it's possible to use Iceberg with some engines such as Spark, Trino, Flink, Presto, Hive, and Impala, of course, as other engines. And to answer the questions of what AWS services could be used with Iceberg, really any service that supports these open source frameworks can use Iceberg. But commonly, from what I've seen in my experience, Amazon EMR, AWS Glue, and Athena are three of our most commonly used services with Apache Iceberg. Amazon EMR or Elastic MapReduce is a framework for running things such as Spark, Flink, Hive applications, and those subsequently can use Iceberg. It works very well for large-scale data processing. 
AWS Glue is a serverless ETL tool that's primarily based in Spark. So it also supports Iceberg very well by extension of Spark. And um, Amazon Athena um, is using um, a variation of Presto behind the scenes, which of course by extension supports Iceberg very well. So again, there are definitely more AWS services that support Iceberg, but these are three that we see commonly used with Iceberg. Given all of this information, I'd now like to actually uh, move away from some PowerPoint slides, and I'd like to talk to you and give you a demonstration of Iceberg in action with some of those commonly used AWS services. So to begin our demonstration, um, I'm on the AWS console here, and I've already opened up the AWS Athena service in a new tab. In Athena, I already have a table created called Amazon Reviews Parquet. I'll preview this table to show you what it looks like. You can see that this is just a generic table with some sample data on Amazon Reviews. And this is not an iceberg table. This is, again, just a publicly available table. So I have a few operations I want to run to show you how iceberg would work on Amazon Athena. So we've created our iceberg database, which you can see here. It's an empty database right now. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a table in this database, which is going to be an empty table. And you can see that I'm specifying the schema here. And this is going to be a table type of iceberg. So this is in Athena going to be an iceberg table with the parquet file format and a target file size of around um, a half gig in size. You'll see that the location of this table is in this particular S3 bucket. So let's run this query. You'll now see that we have this table created. And if I query this table, you'll see that it's an empty table right now. We've established a table, but we haven't actually placed any data into it. So what we'll do now is we'll run this command, which will insert into our iceberg table from that other table that we were looking for earlier. And we'll apply some filters for product category just to work with the subset of the data. This will load about 6 million or so rows into our iceberg table from that other table that we were looking at earlier. When this query finishes populating that iceberg based table, we should be able to do two things. One is we should be able to now requery that iceberg table and see the sample data. And the other thing that we can do is we should be able to go to our S3 bucket, look at the bucket, and actually see that the metadata and the data files are created. So that query was complete. Let's sample the data in our table, make sure our table actually has data which we can see. So in this query, Athena is actually querying an iceberg table from S3 that we established earlier. And also if we go to S3, we created that iceberg table at this particular location. You can see we have this Amazon reviews iceberg folder and we have our data and metadata. So our metadata is subsequently captured here and our data you know, it's uh, partitioned out, but are subsequently captured in these subfolders. So this is an example of getting started by creating that iceberg based table. You could see it's as simple as passing some additional table properties to Athena and populating it with some data. Let's now look at some of the more advanced capabilities that iceberg gives us or those benefits that we talked about. The first thing we can look at is schema evolution. What I want to show you is that we can here, since it's an iceberg based table, we can alter the table. We can add a new column um, called comments, which is a string column. And notice how quick and easy that was. Again, in place up updates, we added the table. We didn't need to rewrite the whole data set. We can also update the data set. So we can actually write back to the iceberg data set from Athena here. Um, which is not always something you can do. Athena sometimes is more of a, a reading tool on top of those data. And we can, in this case, apply some logic where if the comment is highly rated, 
um, will we'll fill the co comment field with highly rated where the star's rating is greater than or equal to four. We can run this. And once this finishes, what we can do is we can actually verify that that worked by um, selecting our data set. And we'll see that there's that new field from the schema evolution. And we'll see that that field should be populated based on the query that we ran here. Give the query a moment to finish. Great. Now that that's finished, let's actually select our table. Do a select on the table where the star rating is greater than or equal to four. And you'll notice that we have this new field over here, comments, that we populated based on the logic that we just did. So this is a good example of the schema evolution in Iceberg. We can look next at the time travel and the, the, the snapshot versioning queries. So I want to start here by running this query where we can actually look at the Iceberg table's history. You'll see that we have snapshot IDs for the first snapshot that we made where we populated the table and the second snapshot that we made where we adjusted the schema and also updated some of those fields. And notice that the snapshots have an ID. Um, they have a parent ID if they uh, have a parent. And then they also have a timestamp. So one thing we can do is we can query the data from past snapshots using Iceberg. So to do this, if I take the original snapshot ID and I place it here, what I'll do now is I'll query this Iceberg table as of that first snapshot. So if you notice, if I scroll all the way over, that comments field that we added as part of the second snapshot doesn't exist here. And that's because we're querying the previous state of the table. Now, if we pull up our snapshot history again, the example I showed you is querying the table as of a particular snapshot where we're putting a certain snapshot ID in. We can also query the table table at as, as of a certain point in time. So notice here that I can put this timestamp in. And what I can do is I can do a select statement from this table as of a particular timestamp. This should give us a similar result. Um, the difference here again is that we're using a timestamp instead of a snapshot ID. And again, that comment field that we added earlier isn't here because we're querying this um, as of a time when the first snap, the snapshot zero was in place, the first snapshot, and those additional changes we made it hadn't happened yet. So that's a good example of working with some of the snapshot capabilities. We could also delete rows from our iceberg table. If I want to delete where a particular product category is um, software here, I can run this. And what we'll do is once this delete finishes, we can actually verify that the delete worked by running a query looking for the product category software. And if we see that that doesn't return any rows, then that helps us understand that those rows were successfully deleted. So we'll give this a few moments to finish this query. Great, and this query is finished. So next, let's actually verify that that worked. Let's try to retrieve some of that data. And we should see that zero rows are returned because we just deleted that data where the product category is software. We're scanning the entire table here for any product category equals software. So we'll give this query a moment to finish. And you can see that there's zero results returned because we just deleted that data. The last thing I want to show you in using Iceberg and Athena is how we can actually retrieve that deleted data that we just deleted. So say you deleted that by accident. Well, the first thing to understand is that in the deletion of that data, we generated a new snapshot, which makes sense. It's, a, it's our third transaction or the third thing that we're doing. And what we can do is I can take the second snapshot ID, enter it here, 
And I can run this query where what I'll do is I'll insert back into the table the product category information from the table snapshot before I deleted it. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm getting that product category data that I just deleted by querying the snapshot before it was deleted, and I can reinsert it back into the current table. So this is a good example of um, restoring deleted data using those snapshot capabilities. And now if we run a query and look for that product category software, we should be able to find records of it because we just restored that data or wrote it back into the current version of the table. And you can see 10 results are here, because we limit it to 10, but that product category software data is now available to us because we restored it back. So this gives you a good idea of uh, how to roll back or retrieve some deleted data, again, leveraging some of those capabilities that Athena gives you when working with Iceberg. Now that we've covered Athena, let's take a look um, at EMR. EMR using Apache Spark in our case and how that interacts with Iceberg. I'll close my Athena window. We can go back to the AWS console homepage. And we'll launch the Amazon EMR service. To save time, I already have an iceberg or an EMR cluster created. And we'll be taking a look at this from the standpoint of the EMR notebooks. EMR notebooks give you a Jupyter notebook-like interface where we can work with uh, Spark code as an example on top of EMR. So I'll give this a moment to start. So now that our notebook is available, we'll open Jupyter. And I've already uploaded an Iceberg PySpark notebook. Great. This is a sample notebook that walks you through how to do some common operations with Iceberg um, using Apache Spark. And in our case, uh, that's Spark running against EMR. It would be pretty similar if you're using uh, AWS Glue as well. And the first thing that we'll want to do is we'll want to make sure that in our configuration, we have the correct S3 bucket selected. So let me verify that. You can go to our S3 console again. And we have this particular bucket, which we can use, uh, same bucket as earlier. Excellent. So now we'll run this command. This is just some configuration information to um, set up some prerequisites for Iceberg. We have our bucket name here. We'll set that as a variable that we can use repeatedly. And we'll import some uh, frequently used uh, PySpark operations, some PySpark SQL operations. Those will be helpful in some of our later operations. We'll give these a moment to execute. Awesome, you can see that our Spark application started. And the first thing that we'll look on is look at is creating an Iceberg table. You'll notice that we'll be using Spark SQL where we have pretty similar to earlier SQL expressions um, executed through Spark. This again speaks to that uh, rich SQL interface that Iceberg really prefers. And this is a create table statement where we're specifying the schema, the location in S3. Let's create this or run this command, which will create the table. Excellent. And then we should be able to, if we just do a, a show tables in our local dev database, you can see that there's this iceberg table and that's the table that we just created in this previous command. So right now we have an empty iceberg table, um, which we can use subsequently. So what we'll do next is we'll create some, some sample data here. Um, I have a really simple uh, data frame here that just have some first names and they have a ID as well that go with them, uh, one through six. They have a create date and the last update time. So this is just creating a really simple uh, data set with six rows in it. And we're putting it into this input data frame uh, variable. Now what we'll do is we have this 
data frame with these six rows. Let's actually write that to our iceberg table. So you can see we're taking the data frame, we're writing it to the iceberg table, um, and in this case, we're appending those records. Once this finishes writing, what we can do is we can go back to our S3 bucket. We can open it up. And you'll notice that we have this iceberg folder. This is the folder for the iceberg table that we created earlier. Go into our database and you can see we have our data and metadata folders here. So very similar again to Athena, except executing it through EMR. So now let's actually do a query on that table. Let's read the data from Iceberg. So you can see here we have the six rows. Um, this matches what we, what we had in that uh, input data frame that we created. So what we've done so far is we created an empty Iceberg table. We wrote some data to it and we read the data from it. Let's now actually update and delete some data uh, for the Iceberg table. So to do this, I'll create a new data frame with um, some updates to some of the records, like we'll do Chris to Christopher, um, you know, uh, make some of the first names uh, longer. Uh, we'll put that into a data frame, and then we'll create or replace a temporary view on it. So we ran that. And now this is what we can do here is this is um, in Spark SQL, we can use Iceberg's merge into statement. The merge into statement is going to allow us to merge that data frame with the updated data and merge it into the current data set. So we can run this. This is again going to make those updates. The other piece I want to call out as well is you can also see that in the data frame that we're merging here, we labeled uh, one of these rows, uh, row five, Eric. We added this flag uh, delete. And then if you look at our merge table statement, you can see that we're saying that when the column change type equals the delete to delete it. And then we're saying here that when the column change type update equals update to do an update. So this merge statement should be taking care of both updates and deletes for us. And if we query that updated data set, you can see that Chris has gone to Christopher. We have um, Emmeline. And then you can also notice that that row that we wanted to delete, row five, no longer exists here. So this is, again, a good example of using the merge statement in Iceberg to and Spark SQL to actually apply some updates and deletes to the Iceberg data set. Now, let's take a look at some of the snapshots. Snapshots work um, the same, whether you're using Athena or whether you're using this, um, which is EMR. And you can see that we have a couple different snapshots here, uh, two snapshots to be specific. So what we can do now is we can um, add a new record to our data set. So you'll notice that I created this new record bill. Um, and then I'm going to append this to the data set. So you can now see that we have the three snapshots here since we just added the record bill. So this is a good example of some of the common operations that we saw we did in Athena earlier, but now doing them in EMR using PySpark. And I want to leave you with some resources that you can use to explore Iceberg on EMR and Athena more. If you look at these resources, the first resource is we have a really great workshop that will walk you through how to do everything that I did using Iceberg on both EMR and Athena. There's also a GitHub repository available, which will have the materials that you saw I used in this particular workshop. And I linked several blog posts as well, which are really excellent and deep dive in a few additional areas of Iceberg that you might find interesting, um, such as using them for CDC upshirt based operations. Um, and then there's two blogs on one using it with Athena and EMR and Glue as well, um, and one looking at the ACID compliance piece of it. So feel free to use these resources to continue to explore this topic further. Given that, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed the session.